from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 15th annual National Book Festival. Isn't this a wonderful day to celebrate books? Hey, hey. Not even a broken ankle could keep me away. Uh, I, my name is Tim Smith. I work for Book World at the Washington Post. Uh, and I'm obliged to tell you that the Post has been a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival since its inception. Uh, Jane Linskold is the author of more than 20 science fiction and fantasy novels and short stories. And she is perhaps best known for the six-part Firekeeper saga about a girl raised among wolves who was brought back into human society. Her most recent novel, and the one many of you are probably here for today, is Artemis Invaded, the second part of a series about an archaeologist who finds a lost pleasure planet that could give mankind back unimaginable powers. One reviewer said of the series that it is worth sticking around for to see what happens next, and I agree. It gives me great pleasure to present to you Jane Linskold. All right, first of all, all of you people hiding down in the back, I do not bite, except socially, so feel free to come on down and uh, join the fun. See, I'm throwing water at people. Okay, first thing I have to tell you is I was born in Washington, D.C. <laughs> it's on my birth certificate and everything. When I went to college in New York, my roommates loved to tease me about the fact that I couldn't be a citizen of the United States because D.C. isn't a state. So when I was leaving New York to take my first job, my, uh, one of my roommates drove me to motor vehicles in New York. And you've got, never seen motor vehicles until you've seen it in New York City. Room huger than this, lines up, people speaking every language you can imagine carrying on. I get up to the front. There's a fellow, I think he was Korean. I think his granddaughter was translating for him, all the rest. I hand over my birth certificate. And the woman goes, District of Columba? District of Columba? I'm like, ma'am, Washington, DC, native's capital, she, nation's capital. She's ignoring me. District of Columba? Hey, Madge, do we take birth certificates from the District of Columba? And of course, my friend is just losing it. So uh, here I am, a citizen of the United States who is not from the United States. I currently live in New Mexico, and my husband and I occasionally get complimented for speaking English as well as we do. <laughs> so there you have it. But it's just incredibly exciting to be invited to speak by the Library of Congress. Last night they had this wonderful gala and we went over and I'm walking around this building that I remember going to in school trips and I'm like, I'm a guest here? So thank you very much. I'm, I'm incredibly excited and honored to be here. Now, the paperwork we were sent for this gala told us that uh, we should be prepared to give small, intimate talks. They didn't tell us it would be in a yawing hall like this. So I'm going to just pretend that I'm talking face to face with each one of you and tell you a little bit about how a really shy kid ends up uh, writing science fiction and fantasy. And we're going to save 15 minutes at the end for questions, so please have some. Otherwise, I've got to make things up afterwards. So. I really was very shy as a child. I'm still actually very shy, but my first job was teaching college, and after freshman English at 8.15 in the morning, nothing that involves a more or less voluntary audience can, uh, can be quite as frightening. But I really was very shy, and books were my best friends, uh, without a doubt. I read constantly. 
I avoided having to go to recess, which was a terribly frightening process because I had, was nearsighted and couldn't do jump rope by uh, volunteering in the library. And I would go in and give the librarian her, her break so that I didn't have to go to recess. That gave me books. Many years later, I saw her and she said, we're switching over books and I am still finding books. You know, we're switching our books over to a more computerized catalog system and I'm still finding books that you were the last person to check out. <laughs> so how did such a kid become a writer? Well, one thing that I've learned about writers is very often writers tend to be isolates in one way or another. Uh, only child, first child, otherwise something that cuts them off. There are, of course, exceptions, because exceptions are what proves the rule. But uh, if you're an isolate, your number one playmate is your own imagination. And so I'm the oldest, and on one level, it looks like how could I have had any time to myself? My next closest sibling is a year, less than two years, younger than I am, and my brother was born on my third birthday. So from that point of view, you pack them in pretty well. But on the other hand, it takes a while for babies to become people and people worth playing with. So there were a lot of years that I only had myself as a playmate. So that's one of the things that makes a writer, is in some way, shape, or form, learning to like the company of the space between your ears as much as you like the company of anybody else. But having siblings really also had a huge impact on me as a storyteller. The sister who was born a uh, year and eight months or so after I was, and I shared a bedroom and a bed until I was about 12. And I've always been a vivid, vivid dreamer. And she very patiently would listen to me to try and tell her what I had dreamt the night before. And of course, dreams don't make a lot of sense. So you find yourself creating bridges to make things fit together, you know, instead of the, and then somehow I was, I think my brain was already constructing stories out of dreams. And to this day, I sometimes mine my dreams for stories. I have a short story collection coming out in the almost immediate now called Curiosities. And one of the stories in it, uh, Behind the Curtain of Flowers, is completely based on a dream. I read it at a local science fiction convention and promised them that I was now going to show them that I was functionally insane. <laughs> and I finished the story without telling them why. I finished the story and uh, mentioned I had dreamt it. And this one girl goes, I was wondering how you came up with all that stuff. So having somebody from an early age who wanted to listen to the stories I told made a big difference. I think one of the other large contributing factors was that I'm the eldest of four, but my youngest sister is eight years younger than I am. So at about the time that my brother and sister were getting far too grown up for games of pretend, I happened to luck out and have this lovely younger person who thought it was wonderful that I wanted to play pretend with her. So we would continue to play pretend, and I got lots of stars for being the good big sister who would play with the baby. The baby was doing me a huge favor. That was the kind of play I wanted. And we had these complicated, intricate stories. We would work together with a mixture of little plastic figures and stuff. Sometimes I've got to admit, I feel sorry for what even the nicest kids I see today. They seem to be so programmed, so not given time to curl up with a book or lie on the floor with a bunch of mismatched toys. And they don't get the chance to do the things that I did that gave me an imagination, gave me flexible thinking stuff. Uh, they're constantly off to this event or that event, and they seem to like them very much but I don't regret my childhood one bit. So, let's see what else. When did I actually start writing? 
these things down. Well, there's two versions of this story. My version, which I would have said for years, was that it really wasn't until I went to college that I started writing things down. However, my sister Anne, uh, who's the one close in age to me, claims that I was always scribbling things down, and then when it was our turn to share our, uh, clean our shared living spaces, she would go through and find little bits of paper dropped behind radiators. These are the days of radiators, you know, those big boxy accordion things, um, and things like that that I'd scribbled stuff on, and I never finished anything, and so uh, she was constantly frustrated. But for me, although I remember writing some poetry and some very small things in, uh, in, in high school and whatever, I really don't think of myself as becoming a writer until I began to hit college age. I bring this up because so often you'll attend a writer's talk and it seems so important to them to tell you, oh, well, I was writing before I could write. I remember listening to one, you know, one lady say, oh yeah, you know, I, I was writing before I could write. Uh, I would go and I would tell my mother, write this down, write this down. I want to say, no, you don't have to start before you can read, before you can write. I know one lovely writer, Dennis McKiernan, who did not start seriously writing fiction until he was a grown man with a degree in engineering and... Um, he was in a horrible motorcycle accident that caused both of his legs to be broken, and he then used the time this, that he was in bed with traction to write the novel that he'd always dreamed of writing. So you don't have to start as a prepubescent, brilliant child. You can start much later. You can start as an adult. Don't let people who feel it's important to brag about how brilliant and young they were discourage you. I see this so often. Um, my works are written for adults, but I have a large younger readership as well. And I see a lot of my younger fans I get to know them. They come to me, they're so full of hopes and dreams, and then they hit college age or a little after college, and it all goes away because now they think they can't possibly succeed because they're not going to be the child prodigy. They're not going to be the, the brilliant kid. I once had a young friend of mine. Uh, I met her when she went away to college, took her out for coffee and chocolates, and she literally cried all over the table because she was turning 20, and it was all over because she couldn't possibly succeed because, well, she wasn't going to be a prodigy. So. That's why it's really important for me to stress this point. You can start now. If you're 80 and you want to start now, start now. There is no law that says you have to be young or a prodigy. But you can be young, and you can start young, and you can, can love telling stories young. It all goes together. So I'd say another important part of my storytelling experience was when I went away to college, freshman year, freshman, the, the pre-college -ori pre orientation week, I discovered role-playing games. Fantasy role-playing games that you play people to people, rolling dice, making up stories. With the lights in my eyes, I can't see most of you, but I see one head bobbing over there, so someone else knows. In fact, my buddy David Weber, who's hiding in the audience here, um, is also someone who comes out of enjoying role-playing games. But there is something really phenomenal about collaborative storytelling with other people that can really wake up the imagination. And you, uh, you get together, you talk, you play, you bounce things back and forth, and where I really remember first starting writing down stories was trying to put the exciting things that had happened in games down on paper in a fashion that would make other people be able to see how really exciting that day had been. And it was, it was great training. When I was in college, I was raised by parents who came in through the, day, the tail end of the Depression, and they were very, very concerned that all of us uh, understand that life was about 
being able to responsibly take care of yourself and make a living. And so I, of course, became an English major. <laughs> but happily, I really liked it. And I went on and uh, got a master's and a PhD. And I did, in fact, teach college for a while. But uh, it was, I, that is one thing I really recommend. If you want to write, don't take a job in writing. because. Most people's brains only have so much writing time stored up in them, and if you're writing all day, then you're going to find yourself coming home at night and you don't want to write again. So being an English professor was actually a very good thing because I was still involved with stories. I was still involved with all of those things I loved. I wasn't doing something I hated, but I was, I was free to tell stories in the evening. I started trying to publish when I finished graduate school. Up to, before that point, I had probably, I'd spent a fair amount of time writing steadily, pretty much every day, even though I was doing grad school at, on, at an accelerated pace. And when I finished up my, uh, my doctorate, I kind of stood and looked at myself and said, all right, you've been putting all of this time into taking classes, writing your dissertation. If life has this tendency to flow into available space, so right now what you need to do is devote that available space to writing. And that became, even as I was starting teaching college for the first time, my serious, uh, serious second focus was writing. And I started sending things out. And I would love to be able to tell you all the shining story about how I sent out my first story. And it was picked up by a major magazine. And I was launched and on my way. It didn't happen. I collected a massive sheaf of rejection letters. And I kept trying. I was very fortunate at that time to purely by coincidence have met another professional writer who kept encouraging me despite the fact that I was essentially flopping uh, most prodigiously, that he felt I had what it took and all I needed to keep going was persistence. So I persisted. And finally, I sold a short story called Cheesecake to a small magazine that folded. <laughs> So my story came out in one issue after that, but all of the things that you're told, oh yes, get an editor interested in your stuff, they'll keep buying your stuff, nope, went away. But I kept trying and eventually I began to sell things. I was also working on a novel and I finished that novel and I failed to sell that novel. But I kept writing and eventually um, I had a couple of novels in the pipeline and then sort of luck happened. I, my, my writer friend, whose name was Roger Zelazny, had uh, told his agent that uh, he had a promising young writer friend who was looking for an agent and could she recommend anything? And she said, well, actually, Kirby and I were just talking about the fact that we needed somebody new to keep us fresh and so let me see some of your friend's stuff. And I got picked up by Kirby and Kay McCauley of the Pimlico Agency. And uh, Kay is still my agent. Uh, she'll retire one of these days, and I won't know what to do. But uh, I went to a world fantasy convention and to meet Kay. And Roger was doing a book signing, and I was chatting with his editor. And all weekend long, very nice people. The science fiction and fantasy community are warm, loving, embracing people. They're really great. Um, had been saying, oh, why are you here? And I'd say, um, I've finished a novel, and I'm here to meet my agent. And that's where it would stop. But I was talking to John Douglas and another young writer. And this young writer, uh, his name was Jeff. Asked a question nobody had asked. 
what's it about? And I said, well, it's about this woman who everyone thinks she's crazy, and she talks to furniture, and furniture talks back, and her best friend is a rubber two-headed dragon, and, with, and it has different personalities according to the head, and things like that. <clears throat> and John Douglas said, ooh, I like books with crazy people. <laughs> and he bought it. So I, I owe Jeff Breedenberg, uh, if I ever meet him again, I owe him a very large drink. He wrote a neat book called The Man in the Moon Must Die. I liked it a lot, but he seems to have vanished. So people always ask me, why do you write that stuff? I mean, you have a degree in English. Why aren't you writing literary novels? And my answer is, well, to be honest, I'm much more interested in the what-ifs and the might-have-beens and the strange conjunctions of things than I am in recording what I already know. There are plenty of novels out there about male English professors having midlife crises and developing, <clears throat> and developing alcoholism and a crush on one of their younger students who doesn't know they exist and going through all sorts of angst. I'm sorry. Boring. So that is not where I want to go. I really like writing about talking rubber two-headed dragons. I really like writing about spaceships. Uh, I, one of my great delights with writing with David Weber is that I get to do spaceships sometimes, and if I don't make them blow up right, he helps me. Um, I, I like what if, what for, conjecture, odd congruences. Uh, I can't understand why any, everybody isn't doing this. It's the way my brain works, and it, it's what excites me. So my Firekeeper books, which remain my most popular, came out of the fact that I apparently imprinted on wolves at a time I don't remember. I loved Kipling's Jungle Book. I still have the tattered copy that uh, my mom bought us at Safeway when uh, we were little. Safeway was having this wonderful promotion. I wish someone would do this again, hint, hint, and they would be publishers out there. But what they did is they took a bunch of classic novels and they printed them in large book form. And then on the side margins, they essentially provided glossaries for all of the things that you might not know. So if you didn't know a word, because after all, Kipling was writing in Victorian England, sometimes he used old-fashioned words or whatever, they'd just tell you on the side. But it wasn't footnotes. They provided pictures. They talked about different things, like that Baloo the bear, though described as a brown bear, that Baloo is actually probably derived from the word for the sun bear. And then they showed what a sun bear looked like and all of that things. So, it was really neat, and I suspect actually it had a double impact on me. It made all of these older works. We also had a, um, Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and a couple others accessible in a way they wouldn't have been accessible. But the other thing they did was uh, they sparked the sense that books come from somewhere, stories come from somewhere. That also probably contributed to becoming a writer. So the Firekeeper books come out of my longtime love for wolves, but also out of a desire. I felt that Kipling and also Tarzan, uh, Burroughs with Tarzan, had done an excellent job on what is essentially an alien first contact story. So if I was going to do a story about somebody raised by wolves, I needed to give it another angle. And my other angle that I chose to take was politics. I wonder why. Could it have had anything to do with growing up in D.C.? Probably not. <laughs> I think it did very much. You do soak up your environment, and when your parents and their friends sit and discuss the intricacies of politics and know a lot of the politicians firsthand or a friend of a friend or whatever, it makes it much more intimate, much more personal than if you're just getting it off of C-SPAN or something like that. So. The Firekeeper books are both a dynastic power struggle and a person from the outside coming in. 
And what I discovered was that essentially, uh, okay, I've, I've got five minutes until, until questions. Um, what I discovered was that it turns out wolves are very good at politics because once I figured that out, uh, that that pack structure and the constant things, Firekeeper turned out to be very good at power struggles and involved with them. That was fun. Another story that uh, came out of a what if moment was one Christmas Eve, I was at a party my friend Patty Nagel and her husband Chris Crone were throwing. And if you did not want to play bridge, which I absolutely did not want to do, I don't like bridge, it confuses me, um, you could learn how to play mahjong. And a very nice young lady of about 12 named Miranda offered to be my coach. And she sat next to me and as everybody spilled over the tiles all over the table, they, uh, they said, now the first thing we do is build the Great Wall. And if you played Mahjong, you start by building a square two layers top, tall out of the tiles. And I thought, well, that's very strange. The Great Wall kind of goes like this. It isn't a square. But the character that means China, that's a square with a line going through it. It means center, actually. You are here, is essentially what that character means. And I thought, wow, what sort of game begins with building the universe? I want to find out. And so I wrote my three Breaking the Wall books to find out what sort of game starts with building the universe. So that's how and why I do what I do. My current books, as the young gentleman who introduced me said, deal with a motif that I felt had been off stage for far too long. And I always liked it, so I wanted to do it. Lost Planets and uh, Rediscoveries. And the only thing I will say is that uh, the people always say, well, it's about finding lost power for humanity. No. <laughs> I like non-humans as much or more than I like writing about humans, but it's certainly about lost secrets. And Artemis is in fact the planet, and she's a very active character. That's why the first book is called Artemis Awakening, and the second book, Artemis Invaded, she becomes more of a player. So I think we're about to the 15 minute mark. So. Before I, as I close, I just want to tell you the little scrap of paper that I have on my desk. A friend of mine who's a visual artist sent me a packet of small things she had done and a file card with this on it was in it. And I immediately tucked it under my monitor and I look at it every day. You cannot achieve the impossible unless you attempt the absurd. And that's basically a very good thing for a writer, and especially a writer of fantasy and science fiction to remember. Thanks. Now let's have some questions. If you're over there, I can't see you because of the light, so jump up and down and shriek. All right, here comes somebody. Yes. I'm to tell you that Phyllis White of Flying Coyote says hello, oh, and when is the third Changer book coming out? She says that she has, uh, since you renamed the second book, People are thinking there are three books and are bitterly disappointed that there's not. And I'm waiting for another fire, uh, All right. uh, another Stephanie book. Well, I will tell Phyllis hello, give her a hug for me, and tell her I will definitely do my best. Come on, Mr. Manticore and Navy, you can't back out. Your commander in chief is in the audience. Oh, well, that is true. Yes, well, um, I actually have the same question. Uh, will there be another Stephanie Harrington book? And if so, when? Weber and I would very much like to do another Stephanie Harrington book. We've talked about it, and um, it's just a question of people jumping up and down on uh, Tony's head and letting her know there is indeed an audience for it. But Weber and I are all enthusiastic, and we've had some really great discussions about it. Well, that'd be great. So let, let Tony and let Bain know, because we would very much like I did do, uh, at Weber's request, a short story 
for a forthcoming honor verse anthology. It's called Deception on Griffin, and it takes Carl, Stephanie, Climbs Quickly, and Keen Eyes off to Griffin, where they discover a very unusual plot. Ooh, when's that coming out? Weber, do you know? I don't think we have a release date for it yet. Okay. It's not going to come out in 2015 because the deadline for submissions are, is, is uh, January of 2016, so it would probably be 2016 or, so, or thereafter, depending on when people get the, their stories in. I just had a cool idea I couldn't resist, so I wrote it right away. I'm always curious as to your process or different writers' process. Do you have to have a detailed outline or do you kind of know where it's going and just let it take off on its own? Absolutely no outline whatsoever. I'm what they like to call uh, the, the term that's getting bounced around these days. There are two of them, architect versus gardener. And the one I really can't stand is pantser for seat of the pants. And the first time I came across that, I thought, I said, do they mean a German tank? Um, <laughs> But no, I'm, I'm an intuitive plotter, and for me, it's a definitely that what-if question. What if you had a girl raised by wolves who was dragged into a dynastic power struggle? What would happen with her perspective thrown into the mix? And this is going to, you know, this is my functional insanity, but there's this funny little feeling I get, and when I have it, I know the story's there, and I can start writing. But if I start before then, it will suck. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, what happened with all the work that you did before that was not accepted, that it was? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Did you, did you keep all the, all, the, all the work that you did before, the one that was not accepted, that was not yes. published? So you, what do you do? Do you like try to rewrite it? Do you do anything with that? Or? Occasionally, I'll try and rewrite. My very first completed novel manuscript uh, was actually a bit short for a novel. And I later expanded it, and it was published as my third novel, Pipes of Orpheus. But on the whole, I think that unless you are really, really invested in those early stories and you feel that there's something you can't let go of, it's better to keep starting fresh, just like training wheels on a bike. You, know, you put those away. I actually have a binder at home about that fat. You know, I got one of the really wide ones that they use for wedding albums, and punched a bunch of my old stories and put them in there. But I don't really have any plans of going back and rewriting them, because we all need to learn. And one of the things that I think is a mistake people make about writing is believing that because we use the skill daily, even if it's just to do a grocery list, then we are better at it than, we than say, a painter. You need to, just like a painter needs to have a lot of paintings that aren't quite good enough for the gallery, a writer needs to have a lot of stories that aren't quite good enough for print. It's just part of the process. Okay. But you don't have to throw them out, you can still love them. Okay, thanks. Um, I was wondering, um, this is a weird question, but um, how do you think? Do you think like in words or do you think in images? Do you think in That's like- That's not a, a weird question. Movies? That's a really good one. I actually do think in a combination of words and images, but I'm not a really visual person. One of the hardest questions for me to answer is if someone wants to draw a picture of one of my characters or something, I can do it as a sort of reverse no, that's not right, the nose is too long, but I can't tell you from the start because I don't really see pictures in my head. It's more like I hear a colleague of mine when I first taught college was a poet, and he said for him, poems came to him like hearing a voice very distant across the water, and he had to listen hard to find the right words to get them down. And for me, that's sort of how stories are. It's like someone's telling me, the story and I'm transcribing. But I, I don't see, I, I hear. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, uh, here's a what if question. Um, if you could sit down and have lunch with any fictional character that you didn't write, who oh. would it be and why? Oh boy, that's a hard one. Um, Sorry. 
No, it's okay. I'm used to being asked any living person, and my answer is always David Bowie. <laughs> so I would really like to convince that man to tell a, uh, tell a straight line on something just once. Um, I guess he qualifies as a fictional character, doesn't he? Um, boy, probably uh, someone like Jane Eyre. I'd really like to find out why after she left Rochester she went and lived with those really annoying cousins <laughs> as opposed to setting herself up. Uh, I don't think she needed to go there at all. She was perfectly competent. But uh, yeah, thank you. That's a good one. I love that. Um. First, I wanted to thank you for being like the first female science fiction author that I was really introduced to at a time where it wasn't okay for girls to be into like science fiction and fantasy and sure. Star Trek and D&D. &D. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my question is, did you struggle at any time with people having expectations of what you were supposed to write or how you were supposed to write? Because Somewhat, but not really. This is where I was really lucky to meet Roger Zelazny when I did, because he believed in me and my stuff, and he was a guy. And so um, I, didn't, I didn't really have this perception that there would be anyone out there being critical. I actually run into it more these days because I'm not interested in the things that a lot of female writers of fiction are, to me, romance bores the socks off of me, especially if it's contrived. I like it very much as an element in a story, because people do fall in love. But the whole surge of paranormal fiction, where it's essentially a romance novel, except he's a werewolf, she's a junior secretary, they're in love, just bores me. Um, so oddly enough, it's more difficult in a way today, but years ago in a convention in Virginia, um, Christy Marx and I were on a, on a panel, Christy Golden, and uh, she uh, and I were talking about this, and I said, well, for me, I'm so tired of the conventional female characters, I want to do do unconventional ones, and she said, yes, but there should be room for the conventional too, because we, we shouldn't be exclusive. And I thought, you know, you have a real point, and that's why Elise is in the Firekeeper books, because, you know, there's room for girls who get crushes on guys and do dumb things. That's part of the world too, as much as I want my world to be full of, of wolf woman and things. Um, Possibly still one of the hardest things I run into as a female author is the assumption that I'm only managing because I'm married and I have somebody to, quote, take care of me, and it's, quote, a hobby, and that really pisses me off <laughs> because I have been paying my share of our bills as long as we've been together. I supported my first husband. You know, so the automatic assumption, I once heard an editor actually say, and I wanted to shoot him, but he was safely on the other side of the Mississippi, how proud he was that they had rushed a check to one of their male authors because, after all, he had a family to support. And I was like, you bastard. <laughs> Excuse me, I do my part supporting my family, too. Just because I got bumps up front don't mean <laughs> I'm not a valid professional, but we still do, sadly, run into that. Thank and I'm, you. Glad you, I'm glad you found a home in my place. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, regarding science fiction and fantasy, a lot of them are series, and there's a handful of what I consider really good standalones. What inspired Child of a Rainless Year, which I think is one of my all-time favorite standalones? Thank you. I wish I knew, but I'm very <laughs> glad. I'm very glad it came to call, but literally I had been interested in Las Vegas, New Mexico as a potential setting for a long time. It really is as strange as it is, it is in that book. And, but really, one day, the opening lines, I, I was born a child of a rainless year, just came into my head, and I was working with possibly one of the best in terms of simpatico with my mind editors at that point, Teresa Nielsen Hayden. Um, 
and we were on the phone discussing the then most recent Firekeeper novel, and I said to her, um, Teresa, the contract is for another Firekeeper and a to be named later. I think I have the to be named later. And I read her uh, like two pages over the phone, and she said, okay, I'll take it. And I said, uh, do you want to hear more? She said, no, I've worked with you long enough to know that if you say it's there, it's there. So I just sat down. I was the happiest I've ever been writing a book. I can tell you it was just a delight. I'd sit down to do some research. I'd open a book. There would be the quotation I needed to head a chapter. Um, it was a really magical experience. I'm glad that magic has touched a lot of people who've read it. But I wish I could tell you where it came from, but I'm afraid I think somebody just tapped in and wanted their story told, and I got to be the channeler. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm also a big fan of A Child of a Rainless Year, as well as the Changer series, as well as all your other books, too. Thank you. But um, I really love how you evoke the Southwest in the Changer books and in Child of a Rainless Year, and I wondered if you see the Southwest as a character you'll develop in future books. I'll definitely use it. I've been living in the Southwest now for over 20 years. I'm married to an anthropologist, archaeologist, who, which means we, we daily are involved with Southwestern culture and setting. I like New Mexico. After growing up in DC, I, I seem to need a multicultural environment. And uh, New Mexico answers that, but on a much smaller scale. So yes, there'll definitely be more things that use the Southwest because it's home, and I love it very much. I think we have time for one more. OK, my minder here. No? All right. I see, I see some, ah, uh, OK. Oh, sorry, I can ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, for, I, I'm gearing up for NaNoWriMo, uh, National November Writing Month, and yes. I, you were saying that the kind of writing you do is just kind of, it comes to you and you just go and it's very organic. Do you have any uh, recommendations or advice for someone who's just trying out to try and just for one month, just let it go, let her imagination, yes. my technicolor dreams that I have onto the paper? Yeah. Um, write and don't rewrite at that time. Just go. Don't worry if you've got the right word. Uh, the, the biggest thing I hear about NaNoWriMo Month is from editors who say people think that they put it down on paper and it must be perfect. They don't rewrite. Treat this as your boot camp to get those, those first sentences down. Don't feel you need to write a huge amount every day. My guideline for myself, dating back to when I got started, was I was corresponding with Roger Zelazny, and he mentioned in a letter that he sat down three or four times a day and wrote three or four sentences, and somehow it seemed to turn out into a novel every year. Because when he, things went well and he found himself writing a whole bunch more, then he would uh, not count that you know, as, OK, I'm done for the week. He'd pick up the next day at zero. Well, I looked at my life. I was teaching college first full time. I was essentially running a, a rather complicated household. A bunch of them. I thought three to four times a day. When the hell do you get three to four times a day? But I thought, you know, three to four times a day, three to four sentences. I could multiply that and make it 12. So what I set up for myself while I was still teaching college full time was I would write 12 sentences a day. 12 solid sentences, not you know a dialogue that was yes, no, yes, no. And gosh, that did turn into a novel a year, even with a full-time job. So find yourself an acceptable limit. Don't worry too much about self-editing yourself. And let your imagination run free for that month. Then go back and reread it and worry about tinkering. But just give yourself permission to go. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. And thank all of you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.